And welcome, Jonathan. How are you? Doing way too well. <laughs> now, let's get started. You know, I introduced you as a mentalist. So what mm -hmm. exactly does that mean? A mentalist is essentially a performer that uses applied psychology to make it look like he can read minds. But I'm not actually psychic. Nobody is. If, if they tell you, oh, yes, I can read your thoughts like I'm hearing my own, they're lying to you or themselves about what it is they're actually able to do. But when you understand how people think so thoroughly, what that process is and how it applies, you can make it look like you know what it is that they're going to do before they do it. Well, so let's back up. My understanding mm -hmm. was you are a really shy kid. Yes. Is that, was that the catalyst to what you do today? A lot of it was, I, I looked at the popular kids and even in elementary school, right? It all starts stacking up where the popular kids in elementary school get even more popular in junior high and then they're the, the cool kids in high school. And I, I just kind of recognized that process early on and thought, you know, if I don't speak up for myself, nobody else will either. So I, I figured out I had to be my own biggest champion for me to be able to get what I wanted out of life, which is having great friends and having wonderful opportunities. And if I stayed the quiet church mouse, I, I knew that I would be missing out. So I recognized early, all right, you got to learn how to speak in front of a group, be able to speak up for yourself and be able to have an intelligent conversation. So the, the catalyst for that was really learning how to juggle fire when I was 13 years old. It was a really cool thing that I learned to do, but I wouldn't have to say anything to get an audience, to get a crowd. Here's this kid juggling fire. Like, what is that about? So I got a lot of positive reinforcement without having to put myself out there by having to say anything. And then once I got more comfortable with people's attention, then I was able to work with my mentor who taught me how to juggle fire. He told me a bunch of his scripts and shtick and just bits of business. And then I knew, well, if I use his scripting, say it the way he says it, when he says it, I know I'll get his responses, which is laughter and applause. And I started doing street performing in Asheville, North Carolina, and people started giving me money for juggling fire on the sidewalks. So that was kind of the, the start of my entrepreneurial experience when I was a teenager in really a, a rural part of the country. Yeah, that's a great story. Why do you think you were so shy? I have no idea. I just, I would prefer to just watch people and pay attention and see what's going on. And being around lots of people is emotionally exhausting for me. But, you know, that, that isn't a worthwhile enough excuse to not do it, right? I love because, that. I love yeah. that you said that because I have a 16-year-old. And he's much like that. He would prefer to have one friend, does not want to have a pool party, doesn't want to have a lot of people at the house, even though we've got ping pong and pool and, you know, everything. Yeah. He would much rather just be on his own. And I think you you hit on something that work, that's like that for me in a sense is that being around a lot of people is exhausting especially you in what you do as a quote mentalist, um, being more tuned in to others and how they feel more, em more of an empath. It is exhausting when you're taking right. in a lot of energy. It, it really is. And recognizing that and recognizing that's how you're wired is really good at being able to take care of yourself, which is priority one. However, I feel like the, the cult of the introvert is lauded as this special thing, as a special pass for never talking to other people or getting out there and, and making a name for yourself. So I make a clear distinction between how I prefer things to be versus what I know gets me what I want. <laughs> right? And 
public speaking, being a performer, getting in front of groups of people is one of the fastest ways of establishing yourself as a leader, as a go-to expert on a topic. It's, it's absolutely the, the best way to do it, mainly because so few people will, right? It's like, even if, even if somebody's outgoing, the idea of standing up in front of a group of people is still daunting. So the, the more skilled you get at the more rare skill sets, then the, the better time you'll have making a reputation as somebody that other people want to give money to. <laughs> so how'd you go from fire juggling to America's Got Talent and on stages everywhere? Long story short is I've been able to recognize the potential for amazing mentors very quickly and identifying, oh, this person is doing exactly what it is that I want to be doing. How can I be of value to that person in exchange for learning everything it is that they know? So I worked with a guy by the name of James Randi, who's internationally famous as first as a, an escape artist back in the 50s. And then during the 70s, kind of got on the scene as a person with a million dollar challenge to anybody who claimed to have actual psychic powers. So he goes, well, if you can demonstrate it, then you get this million dollars. You just have to do it under scientific test conditions. So I worked with him to design testing protocol for the, the million dollar challenge. So I saw every way that people were trying to scam their way to the million dollars and thought, I can do these scams better than they can. And then that's how I built the show that I started doing at colleges and then really got a lot of performing experience under my belt at colleges and then moved to do a more corporate work where I'm the entertainer at a conference or an MC for a conference but then also transitioned into a training dynamic where I teach people how to be a better public speaker, how to be more effective as a negotiator, how to streamline their sales process by using leveraged psychology, how to be more influential, all that kind of good stuff. And it was all those skill sets that I was using in my own life, in my own business. And it was those skills that got me onto America's Got Talent and in those kind of national TV projects. So as a mentalist, yeah. so, so yep. what, what did you do? What exactly do you do? What is your magic? Well, a, a subtle distinction is a magician usually can do magic tricks regardless of an audience or not, right? An illusionist can make the tiger appear in the cage, whether there's anybody sitting in the seats or not, but a mentalist, it's, it's more of a collaborative effort. I can't read anybody's mind if nobody's there, right? So basically, it's just I ask people <laughs> to think of stuff and then, and then tell them what they're thinking, which is dealing with the most interesting thing in the universe with my audience, which is them. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big, big nugget of wisdom right there. If you make it about them, it's so much more interesting than if you make it about you. So that's why, what is it, the Zig Ziglar thing? You can get everything in life if you help enough people get what they want, right? So don't think about, oh, I want to make money. I want lots of money. I want this. I want that. It's more of how could I help other people get what they want in a way that's valuable to them? And it's only by figuring out how you can help other people that will make your life better. Mm, that's wonderful. I w that's wonderful. But I think that's hard for people, right? If, if you spend your life trying to always be for another, which is beautiful, right? And I want to be of service too. Mm -hmm. um, but I also need to eat. Right. And well, pay the that, bills. Right. And, and that's the, the thing is helping others doesn't automatically mean you have to be a martyr. You can help other people without compromising your integrity and without harming yourself, right? So you have to maintain your own boundaries and have a strong sense of what you're about and what you're not about and never compromising on those principles. Then you're in a position to help other people, but it, it's just like the, the oxygen mask on an airplane, they tell you, you've got to put the mask on yourself first before you can help other people. So 
confusing putting yourself at risk for helping other people is a fundamental mistake, right? So too often people conflate uh, putting yourself at a disadvantage with helping other people. But if you're helping other people at your cost of your well-being, mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, whatever it is, you're not actually helping those other people. You're only hurting yourself because very quickly, you're not going to be able to help anybody when you are maxed out stress-wise, financial-wise, whatever it is. So if you want to help the most people, the best thing you can do for the most people is to help yourself. Yes, but I also think that also intertwines too with you knowing your value, understanding exactly. your value and your worth, right? Exactly. So it, it, it seems like two competing things, like yourself first. You can only help yourself by helping other people. Well, that, that's, that's the secret is you're helping other people get what they want by doing what it is that you're really good at and enjoy doing and is something that other people value, right? So that's the, that's the tricky balance between the two. Well, and understanding your own value, right? Really right. realizing I'm worth, most of us equate it, our value with money. Mm-hmm. So recognizing I'm worth X number of dollars an hour or a session or whatever it is, Right, and, right. And I don't I'm not sure that a lot of people really understand their value. It it's brutal. It's really brutal because the true minimum wage is zero dollars. Like that's that's really what you deserve. Zero dollars, man. What you earn, what you're capable of earning is strictly the amount of value you can create in a particular market or dynamic. And what that requires is a ruthless evaluation of the real value you bring to the table. So if somebody thinks that just because I show up at this place called an office and provide this value, which is my attention, that equals paycheck, absolutely not. You've got to make the company more money than the company is going to pay you. Otherwise, nothing works. And if the sole value you're providing is taking these numbers that are already printed off on the page and now putting them back into a computer, that's the only value you can bring to the market. That's not so valuable, right? But making connections, synthesizing information, finding solutions to problems that cost a company a lot of money. Now you're talking about stuff that's valuable. That's a place where your creativity and intuition come into play. And the more problems you solve, the more value you really bring to the table, the more value you're creating for yourself. But just declaring, I'm valuable. I'm worth this much paycheck. No, man, you got to earn it, right? There's a difference between human dignity and being a valuable human being versus a value within a marketplace. Exactly, exactly. I I come up against, um, I do a lot of private coaching, a lot of people stuck or paralyzed or in some, some kind of fear, which obviously is one of the big things that holds people back. And it's really getting them to understand that it's all out there. We, we can all grab it. What's stopping you from grabbing it? Is it, is it this conversation that you don't understand value or your value? Or is it something else? Fear of success, fear of failure, whatever that is. Right. And it all traces back to how they think about their time, their choices, their energy, their situation. Everything could stay exactly the same. Just your mindset changes and suddenly you recognize new opportunities. They're not new. They've always been there. It's just you haven't had the ability to recognize what was staring you in the face in the first place. So that's why, to me, the mindset and psychology is the fundamental building block of success in business and life because you can practice whatever you want, but if you don't understand it, man, you're working at a disadvantage. 
Yeah. Why do you think people have a hard time making change? Because the problems they have right now, they know, they understand, they're comfortable with how awful their situation is. It's, it's the better the devil you know than the devil you don't. So mm-hmm. it's a double whammy. I'm comfortable here. I know this problem. So I'm, and it's not a conscious, I want this to keep going, but it, that's exactly what it is. The other part is the beliefs that people who don't have these problems are bad people, right? The belief that people that have a lot of money only get there by lying, stealing, and cheating other people. So therefore, if I start making money, I'm clearly a bad person. Who am I cheating? So that belief that only rich people are evil, right? Then I have to stay a virtuous person, which then translates to, I got to be poor. That's why my, my background, I have an education, like my, my background, my education is in painting and visual design, right? That's my degree is in, in studio art. And that belief that, oh, it's the starving artist, where if, you're a, if you are a financial success, you were there for a sellout, and the quality of your work can only be good if you're poor. To me, that is an insane belief, right? Because you don't have to be poor to be virtuous, right? You can actually do more good for the world, for yourself, your family, your friends, the people you care about, and everybody who you buy services from and goods from, you're actually doing more good for the world by making yourself wealthy, by honestly providing value to a market. So so that's a a big part to me of, of why people stay in their problems. They're comfortable and they've got beliefs that aren't coherent with reality that keep them from pursuing a better path. Well, and then the other side of it is that those people who actually come to me squirming and uncomfortable being stuck then have an underlying fear of some kind or a very old limiting belief they bring to the party that stops them from going anywhere. Yep, right, so- right, exactly. Because that's, that's the belief that they aren't even aware of just the way that a, a bird's not aware of wind and a fish isn't aware of water. It's just the environment it lives in. So of course it's this way, right? So making change is tantamount to going from a fish to an amphibian, being able to spend some time out of the water on land and being able to see a new world, but then you're more comfortable in the water, so you scurry back. But then you can spend more and more time on land and now you're a land dwelling creature and you get used to that and that has its own problems, right? So it's a kind of a personal evolution out of the swamp of misery onto the muddy territory of progress onto hard earth where you can really build something and then you learn to transcend it and now you're soaring and seeing the whole world. Uh, well, to, to there's a whole bunch of metaphors. <laughs> uh, one of the, uh, the, people that I really admire and read a lot of is a a Vietnamese monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, and his saying, no mud, no lotus. Exactly. And there you go, right? The the Navy SEALs way of putting that is embrace the suck. (laughs) 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 Right? If you don't go through the fire, you're not going to forge anything worthwhile. So. There's a beautiful yeah. poem, and I couldn't do it justice by Hafiz, and it is just that. It's embrace that suffering, embrace the difficult times. Don't be in such a hurry to move beyond the muck, because there's a lot to be learned in that. Right. And, and we're always so ready and anxious to move on from pain. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's important to dwell in that. Right, right. It, it's really easy for people listening to the conversation to ignore it because they go, well, this is spiritual stuff. I don't need to pay attention to it. Well, this is just abstract ideas. So I don't need to pay attention to it. This is just feelings. So I don't need to pay attention to it. It's all made up. Okay. Let's look at something you can't argue with physical reality. Now, how do you get stronger? You work with heavy weights. It's, resistance. You work with the resistance 
and only by working with the resistance can you get stronger. But so many people go, oh, I can't lift weights, I'm weak. Like, that's why you're weak. You refuse to lift weights. It's only by working with that resistance that you can get better. So the more that you avoid that resistance, the, the weaker you become physically, emotionally, mentally, in every dynamic. So that uncomfortable resistance feeling is actually the feeling of progress. So that, that fundamental feeling, idea, resistance, that is how you know you're getting better as a person. And the faster you withdraw from that sensation, the faster you're running towards failure and, and staying in a position you don't want to be in. Well, it's the so, basic law of physics, right? That which we resist persists. Exactly. And exactly. it's interesting. This is a great conversation for my own um, group of people that I work with because I also teach mindfulness and meditation. And a lot of people come to me, I can't meditate. I can't stop my thinking. I'm like the reason that you can't meditate is that you're not willing to stop and sit and be still and just practice just right. practice, just stay in it. Because, you know, I, I end up saying to them, I can teach you absolutely everything I know, but if you walk out of here and you don't use what I've taught you, we just had a really nice cup of tea and a great conversation, right? Right, right. But it, it makes as much sense as when people say, oh, I could never do yoga. I'm not flexible. Oh, I could never lift weights. I'm not strong. Right. Oh, I could never do this because this is the thing that lets me do that. Right. It's a chicken and egg thing. It's like, yeah, you can't do it because you're weak, but you're weak because you don't do it. Exactly. So no matter what that skill is, whether it's being attentive to your existence, being attentive to the people in your life, whatever that skill is, abdicating responsibility of improving that skill because you're bad at it is the, the mindset of failure. So if, if you ever are thinking, oh, I could never do that, well, you're right because you don't do it. <laughs> the only reason you don't do it is because you don't do it. I mean, <laughs> That's right. It, it's so simple when you get it that you just wonder why you had ever thought of it any other way. Yeah. And so now you're on this crazy path. You've written a book, right? Tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah, the, the book is, it, it was born out of, all right, I, I got to back up. So I, I do a mind reading show, right? And then I'm basically doing the impossible thing, right? Something that should not be able to happen I'm doing left, right, and center. Okay, let me ask, let me talk to you about an example of you that I saw. Okay. Uh -huh. You were working with this man. There was a picture of a boat and some smokestacks. And the late his wife had a balloon that she was popping different colors of, mm -hmm. and he was to draw this picture, color in the boat that was on there. Right. And how in God's green earth. Did you use the same colors he did in your picture at the end? It's I, a, it's a neat trick, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, that's, that's the kind of thing, right? Is I make impossible coincidences happen, right? So, so not that example specifically, but like if I asked you to think of a word, I could go through the dictionary and just start at aardvark and read through it, eventually I'll get to your word. That's not impressive. The only thing that's impressive, if I can guess it the first or second time in, I mean, that, that's amazing. So I, I would get these kinds of questions after my shows, right? Like, now how in the world did you even start learning how to do this stuff? Is this just a gift or is it a skill, right? So I kept getting the same questions over and over and over again. And I started talking to people after the show, right? Because I'm, they don't know I'm not a rock star. So I'm signing autographs and, and all that stuff after, after my shows. So then people stand in a 45 minute line to, to talk to me. And people kept saying, man, I can't even imagine doing what it is that you do. And that's when it clicked. It's like, if you can't imagine anything different, how are you going to make something different? And that applies to their life. 
right? So if they can't imagine a different life than the trajectory they're on, man, they're just going to stay in that same trajectory, good, bad, or ugly, right? So I started talking to people, here's how I think about things. Here's how I make decisions. Here how, here's how I've gone about getting to be one of the best in the world at what I do. And then a couple of years later, I started getting emails. Thank you so much for taking that time to talk to me after that show. I, I made these changes and now my life is like this and it's amazing all because of that conversation. And I went, ah, oh, man, now, uh, now I have to teach, <laughs> right? Because the show helps people forget their problems for an hour, but then they go right back home to them. But the techniques that I'm using on stage, grounded in psychology, and then I realized, oh, these are the principles that people can use to make lasting change in their life. So now sharing those psychological techniques help people make change long-term in a positive way. So I, I basically went, all right, what are the 20, 20 same conversations that keep popping up over and over again? Let me put it all into a book so that way people can have these conversations, these life-changing conversations with me without me even having to be there. So people can, can curl up with, with me and a cup of coffee and know my thoughts on how to think about things and then learn how to apply it in their own life without me ever having to show up. So, so now it, it was the best way that I knew how to help as many people in, in the world as possible, as quickly as possible, because there could be infinite numbers of my books in only one of me. So if, if what we've been talking about sounds good, that's the best place to go to, to learn how I think and how it can help you. Now, what philosophy do you live by? Is there a general overarching philosophy that guides your life? Ooh, my guiding philosophy is the non-aggression principle. Do whatever you want as long as it doesn't infringe on somebody else's rights and liberties. That, that's basically it. The free exchange of uh, the voluntary exchange of value for value is my, my bedrock, right? Whether that value is time, money, attention, uh, sympathy, whatever it is. Um, if you don't exchange value for value, you're stealing, right? So figure out what value you can provide to the world and that'll get you everything you want. As long as you don't use violence to coerce behavior or to steal value or anything else, right? So no manipulation, no coercion, no violence, but be ready to defend yourself against those who don't have that integrity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who do you feel has most influenced your life path? The person that has most influenced my life path would have to be, would have to be James Randi. That's, that's it. Uh, dear personal friend and responsible for any success I've had, I can trace directly back to him. And if you out there in podcast land haven't ever heard of him and you have Netflix, mark off a couple hours and watch the documentary An Honest Liar and you'll discover why I love the man so much. An honest liar. An honest liar. Yep. It's a, a documentary about him, his life, his professional life, his personal life. And there are lots of twists and turns that not even I knew about that I, that I learned about from the documentary. Awesome. Now, in this journey that you've taken from fire juggling to where you are today, can you describe some tangible ways that you've seen how you've shifted and grown You can't do new things if you're still doing the old things. That's it. Uh, it. It sounds too simple to make sense, but really, you've got to do something different if you want to get something different. And, and a, a more abstract thing is value is abstract, right? Think of it this way. When I was juggling, it's very concrete. It's very simple, right? You can see it. Wow, he's doing something amazing. I can appreciate it. 
So concrete physical things are easy to appreciate, but aren't powerful. The more powerful something is, the more abstract it is, the more difficult it is to appreciate it, right? So that's why like the, the, the most valuable things in your life are the most difficult to appreciate, like relationships, right? Those are the things that really matter, but the things that are the easiest to appreciate is the big bank account or the Ferrari that you bought, right? The concrete physical things are the easiest to appreciate, but the least useful or the least valuable in your life. The most valuable things are the most abstract. You can't measure them, you can't point to them, but they definitely have an effect on your life, and that's relationships. So the quality of your life is going to be directly tied to the quality of your relationships, but therefore are the most difficult to appreciate. So they, they have the least tangible benefit to work on them, but they, they do the most good for you and the world. Yeah, as somebody said, and I don't know who this was, but if you, if you want to determine how well you're doing in life, look at your relationships. Just take a look at the kinds of relationships that you have currently. Right, right. Yeah. And, and it's kind of like, what quality friends do you have? Yeah. That says everything about you, right? So if you have... If your friend's circle is populated by the best in the world at what they do and the most amazing human beings on the planet, that says a lot about you. And if you're hanging out with unsavory characters, you're guilty by association, man. It goes both ways. That's right. That's right. So tell me, tell us, you know, as we try to live life illuminated, what are some of the fears internal or external that you've had to confront for yourself? Oh man. I don't, I have this weird lack of failure. It, it's, it's bizarre. It really is because very early on, like, like I said, I was, I was super shy, but then I learned that competence breeds confidence. And the more skillful I can be, the more positive impact I can have on the world and my life specifically. So I always realized that fear is a lack of competence. That's all it is. You either don't have the experience with a new situation and that's the fear cropping up, right? But basically all fear boils down to loss. But using fear as an excuse to never gain means your loss is guaranteed. So the only thing that creates fear is fear. So it's made up. You make it up. It's, it's your creation and you think it's real and then behave as though it's real and then create the situation where it is made real. So really, it's, it's recognizing that your fear is just resistance to a new situation and worrying that maybe something painful is going to happen, physically, emotionally, mentally, whatever. But that's going back to the resistance. So to me... The, the biggest fear is leaving some of me on the table of, of not creating something in the world that can make it a better place. Because if I allow my fear of failure or of not being enough or whatever made up reason I have to be enough to not create something in the world, well, then that's my worst fear made real. So, so really, my biggest fear is not creating something every day to make the world a better place. Yeah, there's another poem. Um, it says, I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. Right, right. It's, it's a, a marathon, a race. If you still can run after you're done, you messed up, man. <laughs> you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't do it right. So try well, yeah. to... I don't want to gauge it. Yeah. I don't want to be one of those people on my deathbed that says, I wish I had, and why didn't I, or why did I? Right. You know? Right. So I, 
I was there when my grandma died and, and seeing so much of the family around her and seeing all this come together and support each other. You can't buy that, man. You can't buy that. I don't care how Mm. much you pay somebody to care. They won't unless you care. Right. So give all of you to the universe because the universe has conspired for whatever reason and by whatever methods you're on this planet, you're in this universe, you, your space is already being taken up. So own it, step into your life, make it worth something by creating value in the world for yourself and the people that you love. And, and that's the only way you make the world a better place. Love it. So you just answered my last question, which was what piece of advice would you give to anybody listening? Own Uh, it. Just live your life, man. Just, just stop it. Stop giving excuses for yourself to not create a life. Stop believing your made up stuff, right? Because your made up stuff that's preventing you from creating something in the world, you could use made up stuff as an excuse to create it. So the, the argument against <laughs> the argument for could be just as made up, but one of these makes your life better. So I don't even care if you say it's not real. It doesn't make a difference. Your actions do. So whatever fake stuff you got to do to trick yourself into behaving in a better way, do that, man. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Now, where can people learn more about you, Jonathan? Yeah, the, the best place to go is likeamindreader.com. Uh, notice it's not I am a mindreader.com. It's as though you are a mind reader. So go to likeamindreader.com and you can find out about my training workshops, my speaking opportunities, my entertainment stuff. You can find links to, to Amazon where you can buy any one of my books. Yes, plural. Uh, Think Like a Mind Reader is the, the one that's most recent that we talked about. And that's the, the heaviest duty one that you'll get the most value out of. So yeah, that's, that's my hub. And then you can find me on Twitter and I'm technically on Facebook, but I don't spend a lot of time there because it's just an argument hole. <laughs> I don't want to create a world where I spend a lot of time arguing uh, with people. So I, I prefer to, to share stuff on Twitter and on my site and in person with as many quality people as I possibly can spend time with. Terrific. It has been an absolute pleasure getting to know just a little bit of you. Well, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to, to share my passion with the world and, and connect with your audience. I really oh, do appreciate it. Yeah, I'm so glad you were with us and I hope you join us again sometime soon. You got it. My inbox is always open. <laughs> uh-huh. Thank you, Jonathan. You got it.